Council Member Smith. He is excused. Deputy Mayor Herbig. Here. Good evening, Council. I'd like to introduce Rob Say McCord. He's our new parks project manager. And so he'll be working on the Rhododendron Boat House project primarily. That's his main focus, and also the Twin Springs project. So uh, Rob came to us um, with a lot of experience from his prior work in Rhode Island. And he's originally from North Carolina. So Rob, I'm not going to say hello, but. <laughs> Please feel free. Hello, Council. I'm very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to working for a city that's got such a great future ahead of it. And I uh, appreciate working for somewhere that uh, the 2040 award, I think, bodes well for the direction that the city is going in. And I'm, yeah, excited to contribute. Wonderful. Now you have a name and a face to put together <laughs> when you walk through City Hall, you know who, who Rob is. We, uh, we're very fortunate. We have a great staff. It's good to have you join them. I think you're going to enjoy yourself here. I have so far, so thank you very Great. much for having us. Great, thank you. All right, next item on the agenda, citizen comments. This is your opportunity, express your views on issues that are important to you and to the community. And we ask that you uh, limit your comments to three minutes. And uh, we have a timer up on the board. And if the clerk will please call the first person. John Hendrickson. Uh, good evening, council members. John Hendrickson, Kenmore. Um, about a month and a half maybe ago, I sent you guys all a copy of the original feasibility study that the city was founded on. It was founded on a surplus that we're going to have from day one. And, um, and as... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to forward you a summary of all of it. I'm, I'm summarizing the whole thing because as you guys are going forward with a, a public discussion about the need for revenue that you have here that you talked about during the budget process and the tax increases that you need, um, that's the best place to start if you want to, if you, to have a discussion in this community because it's the most objective uh, analysis of our financial situation. And so a couple of things I want to talk about that are in there tonight is that uh, on page 133 of that report, you'll see that they, the, the county talked about that they were going to add a lane to the bridge on the Sammamish Slough back in 19, it was on their six-year tip report to do back in 97, 98. And they said, now you guys are going to have to pay for that. So... You guys didn't get it done this year because of the budget problems back in D.C. And the, you missed the fish window, so you had to put it off another year. That could be a huge blessing if you guys would just do what they were going to do back in 98 and put a third lane on the bridge to bring traffic down. Right now, you have a third lane on the bridge that's just a big walkway. And the economic development that we can have here, if you can add that lane on the bridge like we were supposed to, is so much, 
smarter, I'm sorry to say, than what your plan is. And I've talked about it several times. You have a chance to change it. And that really should be part of the, the campaign with the candidates that are coming up here. I think it's a, the current plan is, is very, is pure folly. It's just, it's, it doesn't make any sense at all. The second thing is in that it talks about you need to be a contract city. Now, in your last, when your budget came out in October, city manager talked about, you know, do we want to be a contract city or do we want to be a full service city? And he kind of talked like as a contract city is a dirty word. We can't afford to be a full service city. That it's totally outlined in that report. And if you go through the history of our finances, it shows you that. And if you want to look at other cities to compare to, don't go to Kirkland and Shoreline. Go to Briar, who has two million a year and no sales tax. Go to Tequila, that has 44 million a year in revenue, the same population as us, except for they have two more square miles, all commercial. And that commercial brings in all that revenue. And then look where the salaries are, like 33 million down there to run a city. And look what they are over in Briar. And look, and what we need to be, we need an environment where we can respect one another, where the public can respect our city officials and they respect us. And right now, if you're not gonna be a contract city, you know, you could have done with Lake Forest Park. You know, you guys kind of upset the balance over there with what I heard from those guys. You could still, you don't have to have the whole contract like that, but you could have one or two people have the equipment over there, hire contract people to do the work over here. You know, we, you know, we cannot afford it if you look at that plan and if you look at our, our financials. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hendrickson. No one else has signed up to speak. Anybody else wish to be heard? Anybody else? Thank you for your comments. Um, we had the plans on the bridge are for the third lane. That it's a big pedestrian lane, but as we grow, that will be converted to a lane. Um, Anyway, next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve? I move. I have a second. Any questions, discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed? Consent agenda stands approved unanimously. Next item on the agenda is ordinance number 19-0483 relating to park impact fees and amendments to the Kenmore Municipal Code 20.47. Ms. Bent. Good evening again. So tonight council will hear comments during the public hearing regarding adoption of updated park impact fees that would go into effect January 2020 if council does adopt the ordinance tonight. Park impact fees are charges paid by new residential development to reimburse the city for the cost of new public facilities. So in other words, growth pays for growth. The fees collected must be expended within 10 years and they cannot be used to address existing park deficiencies such as repair or replacement or to be used for general maintenance and operations. The city hired a consultant newly managed to prepare an updated park impact fee rate study and the results were presented to you at your May 20th council meeting. At that May meeting, council direction was to prepare an ordinance and establish fees effective January 2020 at rates lower than the maximum rate calculated in the rate study, but comparable to an average of rates in six nearby municipalities. So the new rate for a single family unit would be 3,885. For a multi-family unit, 2,980. And for a mobile home, 1,942. There are two minor edits in the ordinance in section three and section four um, to change the effective date for park impact fees to January 1st, 2020, rather than January 2nd. 2020, to, and that would be to be consistent with the date other fees go into effect by resolution for 2020. So those would be if council decides to 
Um, adopt the ordinance tonight. Staff would recommend um, adoption with those minor amendments that the rates would go into effect January 1st rather than January 2nd. So if there are, if there are no other questions. Any questions? All right, it declares a public hearing um, regarding ordinance number 19-0483 relating to parks and pet fees and amendments general municipal code 20.47 to the open. Clerk, please call the first person. No one has signed up to speak. Anybody wishing to be heard on ordinance number 19-0483 relating to park and pet fees and amendments to the general municipal code uh, 20.47? Anybody wishing to be heard on ordinance number 19-043? Anybody wishing to be heard on ordinance number 19-0483 uh, relating to parking pack fees and amendments to general municipal code 20.47? Seeing nobody coming forward, I will, I will declare the public hearing closed. Next item on the agenda is ordinance number 19-0483 relating to park and pet fees and amendments to the Kenmore Municipal Code 20.47. Is there a motion to approve? I move. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Questions? Clerk, please take roll. Council Member Shrebnik. Yes. Council Member Marshall? Yes. Deputy Mayor Herbig? Yes. Council Member Danuski? Yes. Mayor Baker? Yes. All right, next item on the agenda Revi revisions of the 2019 2024 capital improvement program for parks, transportation, and surface water. Mr. City Manager and Ms. Gregory, Finance and Administration Director. Mr. Vincente, our engineer, and Ms. Bent, and Richard Sawyer. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I'll just do a quick intro. Um, not only do we maintain things, we also build things. And this proposed capital improvement plan, which is an amendment to the one you adopted last year, proposes about $99 million worth of capital improvements over the next six years. Uh, we're here to update uh, the plan based on additional, additional information that we have and, um, and other factors affecting the CIP. So with that, I will turn it over to our Finance and Administration Director, Joanne Gregory. Thank you, Rob. Good evening, Mayor and Council Members. So tonight we'd like to present for you an update to the 2019 2024 capital improvement program that was adopted on September 17, 2018. Uh, I'm trying to make this a little bigger. Uh, make it all fit on this on one screen. So updates and revisions include primarily the impacts on projects that resulted from the completion of the surface water fee analysis which council adopted in November of 2018. There are also some revisions to budgets based on information regarding resources and uh, expenditures that is more current than was available in 2018. We were aware in September that the fee analysis which included an increase in the surface water rate structure would enable the city to not only design and improve much needed surface water facilities, but would also provide funds for the surface water components of parks and transportation projects. This had not really been feasible based on the current rate structure and the demands of just operating and maintaining the surface water infrastructure. The analysis presented with the completed fee study indicated that in order to pay for a backlog of necessary surface water improvements plus fund surface water components of current park and transportation projects, a cash flow gap of about $8.2 million was anticipated in the years 2019 to 2021. Unidentified was a source of debt or borrowing which was anticipated with a schedule to pay back the $8.2 million over about 10 years. But when striving to balance this six-year program, we 
considered several possible ways to avoid debt wherever practical. So the cost of the surface water components of the programmed park projects, particularly Squire's log boom and the boathouse, was about $325,000, and we found that this could be funded by park impact fees. The cost of the surface water components of the walkways and waterways transportation projects could be funded by the Strategic Opportunity Fund in the amount of $2.2 million out of available reserves of $3.9 million. Um, so that is how we, uh, that is how we program those resources. But the surface water component of the West Sammamish Bridge in the estimated amount of $1.2 million was retained as a use of surface water funds. This and adding several new surface water projects resulted in an anticipated cash shortfall from 2021 to 2024 of about $3.4 million. But prior to 2021, several factors could change which would impact and possibly lessen that gap. Some of those factors could be with the increase in surface water rates, the revenue may be higher than we are currently projecting. Also, grant opportunities may be available for one or more of the surface water projects. The surface water fund contribution to the cost of a new public works facility may be substantially less if the cost of the facility is less than the $6.5 million currently programmed in the CIP. We may find that one or more of the swim projects could be slightly delayed. And you can see on the cash flow projections that REIT and impact fees have been allocated as much as possible to the various projects without diminishing the funds entirely. But we feel that our revenue projections of those resources are conservative, and if too conservative, we might have some additional help in that area. And finally, public works trust fund loans are an excellent resource for funding capital projects and carry a very favorable interest rate. So in 2020, when we revisit and update the CIP for the next six-year period, more information will be available on most of the factors just mentioned, and appropriate adjustments will be made. However, for planning purposes and pursuit of grants and to present a balanced capital improvement program, I am showing an unidentified other resources line item of $3.4 million. <clears throat> so this evening, the plan is to review each section of the CIP in order of transportation, then parks, surface water, and facilities uh, with John Vicente, Debbie Bent, and Richard Sawyer. And we'll start with a brief look at the balanced plan, which um, I'm projecting on, on the screen, which is really just a copy of what's in the packet. And then there will be an opportunity to ask questions about any of the projects that are presented in the plan. So are there any questions at this time? Otherwise, we will get started with transportation. There does not appear to be any questions. OK. Thank you. So what? What you see on your screen and what you see in your packet um, is the transportation capital uh, improvement program. So these are just the ca uh, transportation projects. And the upper section shows the expenditures and the bottom section is the revenue. And you can see that that is balanced. In the agenda bill is a brief description of the transportation projects, primarily those that have changed in any way since the prior CIP. So at this point, I'll let John uh, answer any questions or um, provide any information you might want about those projects. And I'd just like to note that we haven't really changed anything major within the scope of the projects from what you currently understand the projects to be. Questions? Okay, should we look at the parks? Go to parks. Okay. So these, these are the park projects, everything from Twin Springs to um, the Squires Landing Park Land Acquisition. I would mention that a couple of these, um, the budgets changed a little bit. For instance, the St. Edward Ballfield Improvement EIS study had previously been 
budgeted at $300,000, and now we don't anticipate it will cost that much. So we have reduced that to $200,000. And we have made some modifications to the boathouse uh, budget. And the Squires Landing Park acquisition had been budgeted at, I believe, $1.7 million. And uh, we recently purchased the property for about nine hundred. dollars So we don't anticipate that that needed uh, a full allocation of $1.7 million. So we reduced it as well. And these are the brief descriptions of the park projects. Are there any questions about those? Councilmember Marshall. Can you say what the reduction was uh, for the St. Edwards or what caused that reduction? Um, it was based on an estimate uh, from the consultant that State Parks hired, and they estimated it at 200000 So right now we're going with that estimate. Previously, the, the 300000 was just a, a anticipation. Guess. Uh, of an outside it was, number? It, it was just kind of a, um, an educated guess. Right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, thank you. The next schedule would be the uh, surface water. I can make this one a little bit bigger. This is the surface water uh, capital improvement plan. And projects that were added that had not been in here in September start on uh, right here at line 35. So surface water project 33, the drainage improvement facility retrofit, Little Swamp Creek relocation, North Lake Heights LAD retrofit. Um, th those are new since the last time we looked and uh, at the CIP. So again, in order to balance the CIP surface water component, um, we show a line that is needed to balance that, and that's $3.4 million. So Richard can speak to any questions that you might have about the surface water program. Marshall. Richard. Uh, is the 61st Avenue concerning the creek and stabilization related to the creek, or is it a different surface water issue? So just to be clear, are you referring to the SW8 190th culvert at 61st project? Not the culvert. It was a steep slope. Sorry, I don't have the SW real quick. I just saw it. Let me see if I can grab it. SW32? 61st Avenue stabilization? Yes. So, so that is um, uh, 61st in the southwest part of town, um, down more towards the Arrowhead ah. neighborhood. Right. It's a, uh, we had a geotech uh, evaluate some cracking in the road that we found, and uh, we put in an inclinometer to measure movement and got some recommendations on how to just stabilize some of the movement that we see there. So it's a project to go in there and stabilize that slope with some um, spiral nails that would um, kind of anchor the movement and, and resolve that issue. It's not part of the creek. Right. Thank you. Councilmember Member Januski. Um, yeah, so I'm a little bit uncomfortable with just the $3.4 million of debt um, without a discussion of what what in here really needs to be done in the six years like if we wanted to just approve what we could actually pay for th does everything in here need to happen in the next six years because things are going to fail are there some optional projects that you know as time goes on you could remove if people didn't want to do debt and just wanted to pay for what we could afford um, I didn't see any words on that in there so if you could maybe talk that for a minute so as far as what was added, the um, uh, those projects, I think we could evaluate the timing of. Uh, none of them are um, to fix a you know an emergency type 
issue. In fact, some of these projects have actually been on the books for some time and keep getting bumped due to budget reasons. Um, the one thing I would uh, just mention that getting them on the list is helpful. Uh, many of them are very competitive for grants. Um, the Swamp Creek relocation is a very high restoration value type project that could probably score well. Um, the North Lake Heights low impact development retrofit was actually a grant funded design and that would score very well for um, LID eligible grants that frequently come out in two year cycles. Um, and then having those on your CIP list, CIP list is very helpful in applying for those and showing that there's some commitment to do those projects. But um, we can always evaluate the timing moving forward. So pretty much bringing those onto the CIP was just so you would have a way to be able to apply for grants for these projects, or mostly? Well, I think the intent was to take on some debt. Um, that was uh, when we were evaluating the surface water fees last year. Um, and there was, um, I think, always the presumption that there would still need to be some debt incurred at the beginning because um, we hadn't been collecting those fees, and then now that we're collecting them, there was going to be some upfront shortage in cash that we would have to account for. So the uh, plan has, I think it's more just how much are we comfortable taking is the question. If I could jump in, Your Honor. Um, so if you look at the bottom left corner of that spreadsheet that's in front of you, it shows other resources, parentheses, grants, comma, debt. Um, one thing you could do is um, you could say grants, comma, low interest loans, because I think that is our intent. So um, the state does offer low interest loans at uh, about what percentage under the PWTF? Um, public Works Trust Fund loan that we currently have is like 1.7 percent. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that the rates have gone up since we. They've gone up a little bit. It depends on what type of turn you do. If you do a, I believe it's a five year, it's uh, less than 1 percent. If you do over that, then right now it's about 1.7, I believe. Right. So, um, but in that less than 2 percent range, um, that actually is, I believe, good policy to um, fund a project with an interest rate that low, it's almost free money, uh, given um, inflation and other things. Uh, you might actually be money ahead to get a project done with a 2% interest rate rather than wait five years. Um, so if it, if it makes you more comfortable, we could say other resources, grants, comma, low interest loans. Sure. The way the legislature swept that fund the last few years, it's right. iffy. So this would depend on them funding the Public Works Trust Fund. I, I would like to point out, though, it, it, nothing affects the current biennium. We are totally funded for all the projects anticipated in this biennium. So there is no debt required. Um, we are able to fund all those projects with the resources that we do have. Deputy Mayor. So before um, the city would go out for Public Works Trust Fund loan or seek other sorts of debt, that would come to the council at some point, correct? Absolutely. Okay. So as we're, you know, I, approving this just kind of sets the stage for chasing down grants or other funding resources. And then as we get further on to where your cash flow problems, not problems, but where the cash flow issue is in a couple of years, we can really evaluate. Uh, which projects are coming up, which ones really need to get done, which ones we're willing to stretch for, and which ones maybe we push back a few years. We can always reevaluate re that when the CIP comes back up, correct? Absolutely, yeah, okay. which we'll definitely do uh, about this time next year. Thank you. Councilmember Shirley. Yeah, I had originally some of the same questions that are coming up tonight, and I just want to really appreciate um, Ms. Gregory for addressing them in our uh, meetings that we have during the week and just for anybody's information we get a lot of our questions answered in advance of these meetings um, to help um, us understand the materials better and so I my comment is just a big thank you for all the work that was done to get us to this point and uh, understanding that this will be brought back in about a year.
Any other questions? I'd like, I would like uh, to make one comment about clarifying sure. what um, Council Member Shrebnik just said. Even though we'll do a new CIP plan next year, which will extend it out two more years, as an amendment, we would be bringing this back as an ordinance to amend the current CIP plan, and we would do that in September. Just so that doesn't surprise you when we come back in September with an ordinance to amend. Okay. So this is basically informational tonight, right? It's informational leading up to an amendment right. to be adopted by ordinance in September okay. based on September. this presentation. Right. Right, it's informational, but we do want your direction on whether what you see is adequate or if you have any changes. Does anybody have any changes <clears throat> to this? We're moving in a forward direction. There. Uh, yeah, if I could just um, add one more comment. On walkways and waterways, um, you know, the, the cost of those projects have gone up much uh, higher than we had anticipated three years ago. Um, but this um, CIP fully funds those projects with the exception of a $1.5 million grant we need for Wani to drive and a several hundred thousand dollar state grant we would like to see for uh, Squires Landing. Um, am I missing anything? I think that's about it. But um, that's, I think that's saying something that uh, we were able to find all those additional resources to get those walkways and waterways projects funded. Um, so, uh, and the, the chances of getting a $1.5 million grant for Juanita Drive before we need to go to construction, I think is high. Um, I believe that we will probably uh, score well on the sound transit system access uh, grant that we're applying for, which happens to be $1.5 million. And I think our chances of a TIB grant at a lower amount than we've applied for are also higher. Um, so I'm feeling good about the walkways and waterways funding. I think it's, I think it's a kind of a threefold message to our citizens. Well, well, there's lots of messages to share about our walkways and waterways. Number one, remind them about why we're doing all those projects and, and how they came to be and, and what they're gonna do. But number two, um, tell our citizens that we're on schedule, as we said in the bond measure. The bad news piece is that they're above budget. Good news to that, though, or the counter to that, is uh, we've um, been able to find the additional funding without having to go back to the voters, and we're building what we said we were gonna build. So I think there's some uh, mostly good news in there. Uh, that we can share with the voters. Um, and we plan on doing that in a, in a newsletter update to them soon. We'll probably do a special edition newsletter where we give an overall status update of the projects, but also talk about the schedule and the budget and the funding, um, just so that our voters are up to speed on what they voted on in 2016. One last caveat on all of this is the bridge. <laughs> um, <clears throat> We don't know what this delay is going to do to the construction cost of the bridge. Um, one way of looking at it is even though it delayed construction for a year, it only delayed the bidding for about um, six, eight months. Um, and so that six, eight month difference in bidding may not translate into a full year delay. Um, but we're just keeping our fingers Crossed and and all those other things you do when you want something to come in on budget, but right now we have a total cost co to complete of the, about 35 million, and let's hope let's hope that number holds. Um, if if in the fall when we get bids in and it and that number doesn't hold, then we are going to have to scramble to reallocate the CIP. So let's let's just hope and pray that it comes in at 35 million or under. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So we've got. I, I think everybody's in agreement then to go ahead and.
move forward no changes here on this so thank you okay thank you very much all right mr. Lancaster looks like you've done another fine piece of work Piece of work is probably the right term for it. Um, <laughs> no, uh, I'm, it's my pleasure to be here with you tonight. Good evening, Council. Um, this is something that Rob uh, directed me to start working on when I first got here, one of the first projects I was working on. And it's developed a lot over the summer since I've been here um, with asking a lot of different questions and digging up some information. Um, one of the biggest things that really changed the direction of what I was working on, to give you some background, is uh, we figured out that uh, actually on our books right now and in our code, there's a codified program for a low-income utility tax relief program. Uh, but as you know and as we knew, uh, the city currently isn't administering that, um, and we had no idea that it was there. It was probably a remnant from something in the past, and uh, looking at past ordinances, uh, when it first originated uh, was when council uh, a couple years ago was... Um, originally levying utility taxes and raising them um, to 6%. Uh, part of it was they wanted to, at least I'm guessing from it being in the same time frame, was to lessen a little bit of that impact by implementing this type of program. Um, but later that uh, utility tax was taken back down to 4%, which is where it's at right now. Um, but as we know, the program isn't currently functioning and the way it's written uh, it wouldn't exactly be functional. So tonight, I want to review with you that existing program, what it looks like, how it is, and what the recommendations are to move forward with it. Um, available programs to our residents that Kenmore doesn't run, other programs that other organizations offer that are available to our residents. Um, how many qualified families there are probably within Kenmore for these type of programs. Um, the difference between a rebate and a discount, because um, those are the two main ways that this type of program is normally pursued. Um, and then our recommendation for what should change. So first of all, uh, just to let you know the things that the current program on our book says we should be doing. Um, it says the city clerk is supposed to be the one that determines eligibility once somebody uh, requests to receive the discount. Um, it says 6% in our code for the utility tax, even though it's currently 4%. Um, and it states that the provider um, for natural gas and electric energy will be the one to administer it for us. Uh, so that would be PSE in this case. And in conversation with them, uh, they have no recollection or knowledge of ever administering a program like this for Kenmore. Um, and maybe Rob can speak to this a little bit more, but we spoke to Julian Lowe, who I believe is um, one of the intergovernmental relationship people there at PSE. And, and talking to him, he doesn't think that this is something that uh, PSE would even be able to do or that it's an option because they have a rate study that comes out and they have to keep their rates uniform across all of their service area and if they were to offer this for one city they'd have to open back up that study and determine how they could make that uniform across the whole area um, so and we didn't it, get, a, it has a to get a it has to get approved by the utilities transportation um, commission which is you know not exactly simple so yeah <laughs> yeah and uh, so what, it wasn't indefinite, but uh, that was kind of his initial uh, feelings when we were talking to him about it. Um, so as right now, somebody could walk into City Hall and request that they receive this uh, rebate or this discount, and we would have no method or anything in place to be able to give this to them. So we want to be able to address that tonight. Um, so to give you an idea of what available programs are out there that currently work for our residents, uh, there's the Lifeline program, uh, which all of our service providers for cable um, and phone and broadband services offer within our city. It's up to uh, almost $10. It's $9.25 off their basic service package um, for families that make. So the average size of a family in Kenmore is about 2.6 to 2.8, I think, if I remember right, maybe slightly lower. Um, so if you go between two and three member families, it's about if a family has a monthly income of 1900 to 2300 a month, they would qualify for this program. Um, there's also North Shore Utility District just adopted a new program uh, that's a discount on their water, base water and sewer charges. 
of 45% off water and 50% off sewer-based charges, which is about $30 to $36 a month, depending on if you're a multifamily or single-family residence. Um, and they have a higher threshold than a lot of the other programs, so hopefully this one will be a little bit more wide-reaching than previous ones have been or any other attempts because it's up to about 3,600 per month to about 4,100 per month a family will be making that. So that's higher than a lot of other programs, so we're really excited to see how this program is going to play out. Um, also, uh, PSEs, specifically for the ones that we uh, have utility tax on and also uh, our program covers, the one in the city that talks about PSE, through HopeLink administers what's called the HELP program and the LIHEAP program. And these programs are essentially grant programs where families can apply and get up to $1,000 per year in grants for their um, electric and national, natural gas services. Um, an average family, this one's slightly lower again, but an average family would make anywhere between 2000 to 2500 a month to qualify for this. They also do weatherization grants um, for fixing up their home, so that, that way, instead of discounting the bill, their bill will go down naturally by making their house more warm or more insulated. Um, and we're working with PSE and hopefully going to work with HopeLink and talking to them to get some data. I know in the past the city has gotten data to see how well utilized these programs are, because that can be an indication of even if a um, uh, utility tax rebate program would be dupli duplicative in its services because one of the concerns is why would the city offer something if there's plenty of programs out there already that aren't being utilized for our residents and they haven't just been directed to the right places. Um, in the past the city has uh, tried to advertise these so we're interested to see how those have changed over time um, and maybe Rob could speak to this as well but in the past it seemed like they weren't being utilized as fully as they could be. Yeah we <clears throat> A while back, we met with um, HopeLink, which administers these programs for PSE, and they had data to show that not nearly as many Kenmore residents that are eligible f for these uh, discounts and rebates are applying for them. So at the time, we um, tried to get the word out through our newsletter and other sources, and, and some volunteers went around and um, uh, distributed some flyers to so some of the, some of the um, areas around here in the downtown. Um, but I think one key to this will be for us to help HopeLink and PSE uh, get the word out so that citizens who are eligible for this program will know to use it and know that it's available. And to give you an idea of how many families that are eligible, according to the American Community mm -hmm. Survey, there's about 298 families in Kenmore that are below the poverty level as of 2017. Um, but that could be slightly lower depending on the program. A lot of programs set their thresholds for income based off the federal poverty guidelines. And the way they state it is they'll say an income that's at 150% of the federal poverty guidelines. Um, and if you go by the averages in the area, which are around about 120% to 130%, um, there'd be about 129 families. So anywhere between 129 and 298, depending on what source of data you base it off of, um, could be eligible for these type of programs. Um, I also did some research on what other cities have done to compare what we have on the books to what their programs look like um, and also talk to MRSC a little bit about what is legally within the power of the city to do and uh, what they would suggest. Um, a rebate in the way that this would take form and the way cities like Renton is probably the most prominent example um, is they People apply once a year during tax season and they give in their income tax return or other type of benefits that can be deducted from their income like SNAP benefits or um, Medicare, Medicaid, things like that. And the city determines where their income's at and then they also have to provide proof of residence in their bill and then they're issued a rebate for the utility tax that they paid. Sometimes it's a full uh, rebate of all the utility tax they paid, other times it's a percentage of how much they paid. Um, and this, in talking to MRC, it's a little bit unclear as um, how this works in some cases. In talking to them, they said, depending on if you can establish a clear line in between uh, the person being billed and paying the tax, that is the only way you can offer a rebate. It's difficult because the utility tax is a tax upon the business and not upon the individual. So the question comes up, um, how can you issue a rebate to somebody that's not being taxed? Um, and oftentimes the way that Renton or other cities have gotten away with this is normally on the bill of the person in town, they have a line 
on their bill that shows the effect of the city's tax. Um, so we would look at that and you would use that to calculate how much that person would be rebated. Um, but in my conversations with them, this would be something that we'd really want to work with Don and others if it was an option that we wanted to prove to make sure that it's legally defensible in all cases. Um, and then the other method is a discount. And this is where, um, as it's currently written in ours and as some other cities have uh, written it, but it's different because they're the ones that own that utility, they just don't charge the person the utility in the first place. When their bill goes out to them, if the city's the direct bill or in other situations, they just don't charge that in the first place. This one's a little bit harder to coordinate because you do have to work with other organizations. It's not something that you handle completely in-house. Um, it can be really difficult. Uh, but to keep in mind, even for both of these, whether it be a rebate or a discount, we talked to University Place. They're a city that used to have a rebate program, something very similar to this. Um, and they chose to stop offering it because they felt it was one, duplicative, but also uh, a major drain on staff resources. It started to become something where it felt more like social work for a lot of city staff where they weren't trained for it. Um, and they would in encounter a lot of issues or problems that they weren't really prepared for. And also the amount of time that came around every year to administer the program for the rebate size that people were getting. Sometimes it was only a couple hundred dollars for some of these families or even less and they felt the amount of money that they're pouring into it and staff time and resources for the amount of rebate that families were getting didn't make it um, worthwhile. So something to keep in mind. Um, and then finally, uh, just what we recommend and what seems like the best course to pursue right now um, is to do something about the existing program to repeal it because as we look at it right now, it's a little bit of a liability because um, it's out there and we don't have a way to administer it. Um, and also to work with PSE and hopefully in the future as we have in the past to determine if current programs are being used well. Um, and if they are being used well, if there's additional need um, for another program. And if there is, that's when council can, and that's when uh, we'd like council to direct us what uh, direction to move if a uh, utility program would be merited and we want to redress based on um, this old program, updating it and making it so that it actually is functional and something that we could do or if we should just continue to educate residents based on available programs. Any questions regarding those, um, what I talked about tonight? Councilman Shrebnik. Well, thanks for this. It's, it's really good information, and um, I you know, appreciate the thoroughness. Uh, it's, it's really important that um, people can pay your, their utilities and not have to. Um, go without other important things in order to do that. Um, but I, you know, completely agree that we need to first exhaust all the resources that are out there. My question is, in your research and discussions with the utilities, did you get any sense um, of what are maybe some of the barriers that people experience in trying to use these or reasons why people don't if they're being underutilized? One of the main things that I ran into was uh, a lot of these programs are easily accessible by those that pay bills directly, for example, own a home. Whereas if you're a renter and you're in a complex and the complex receives a bill and then gives a portion to that bill to your rent, it becomes a lot harder to apply for some of these programs because you can't provide that exact bill from the utility company. It's only a bill coming from um, your complex. So a lot of eligible families live in those type of situations and that can be a big problem. But like I said, this is when you run into that sort of legal complexity of like, can you establish a direct line to that person being billed? Um, the city in a lot of instances can't, and that's why programs like LIHEAP or PSE are so important because PSE can. Um, they're a step closer to that individual than the city is and we're removed slightly further. That was one of the main problems in, um, in talking to North Shore Utility District. That was something they really tried to address in their program that's coming out this, this year, so. Also, PSE, their program is extremely difficult to apply for. The mm -hmm. paperwork in it is extremely complex, and as a matter, and as a result, hopefully, has started to provide help yep. for people to fill out those applications. So they're really, really difficult to fill out. Yeah, they often require um, large amounts of paperwork. So you have to document every source of income because normally what happens is you deduct from not just your tax return, but if you receive any benefits or anything from any other sources, you deduct that from your income. 
Um, so it can be really difficult for somebody who may um, be struggling enough with work or not have enough time to find the time to fill out that paperwork. And that's why University Place said it was becoming a lot like social work because they had to sit down and use staff time to help people understand forms. They had to do a lot of translating and the city just didn't have enough resources or training to be able to help people um, spend the time and fill out that paperwork. Yeah, from there. Yeah, I appreciate this, uh, this report. This is very thorough. Um, for what, just my own stance, I voted against our last um, time that we increased uh, taxes on water and sewer a few years back um, because I was concerned about the effects that it was going to have on lower income folks. Um, I understand that we're now kind of looking at the general realm of utility taxes as a possible way to fill um, upcoming budget holes or you know to keep the lines from crossing in the next couple of years um, I understand that we need to clean up our code and I agree that we need to clean up our code because it is a liability to us to have um, something that we can't actually <coughs> do in our code uh, but as far as just speaking for myself if uh, we are going to be considering raising any of these um, I want us to have a very serious conversation about how the city can can move forward with um, addressing low-income folks if we do raise any of these uh, utility fees in the future as part of our um, revenue um, discussion. So right now I'm, I'm in support of, of the staff recommendation, but with the caveat that before I vote to raise any utility taxes in the next couple of years, I'm going to want us to figure out at the city level how to move forward with, with at least some of the more basic things on on water and some other things, how we can uh, plug in and um, make sure that we're not pricing people out of the basics. And I'm in agreement with the Deputy Mayor, but also I, I agree with staff recommendations, but I think it's more of an education process for the city. I think we need to work hard to get some information out there so people know these resources exist. And I don't think it should be the city that is, uh, is, is footing the bill. There's too many different groups offering the programs, and we just need to make sure that we're a good repository. And also on property tax uh, abatements, there is new legislation that was passed that would really be good to make available to people uh, with hardships. I know that every time taxes go up about $100 a year, we lose, people lose their homes because they can't afford it because they're right on the edge. So if we have the opportunity to, to spread the word, perhaps in one of our newsletters or something, I really think that would be good because the cap has always been at 40,000, well, recently has been at $40,000. But to go any higher than that, I think requires a change in, um, in the state constitution. That's what I've heard, but I can't the believe that. Tax yeah. no, the no, the exemption. The it's exemption. Going up. Yeah, it is, it's but it's going up in a different way down. in that it, in order to get around that, they have said it's in a proportion of the median income of the county. That way, King County gets a larger break than somebody over the mountains in Cowlitz or something. So um, there's been a lot of changes, and I really think the public needs to be educated about it because uh, many, many people are having trouble, so I'd like to see us take on that role. Councilman Marshall. I'd like to see a legal analysis perhaps of the code or whether the code as it exists is even enforceable. I, in a sense, I can't conceive how it would have been passed originally uh, and then for it you know, not to have actual power over PSC or how it interplays with PSC to see, see what that is. But it, stranger things have certainly hap happened. All right, anything else? So um, what we, assuming you agree with us, uh, we plan on taking, bringing an ordinance to you probably in September on consent agenda, the repealing that section of the code, um, recognizing everything you just said about education and, and um, the need for a future rebate program should the city ever raise its utility taxes. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's a good idea because it's non-functioning and what do we have a piece of code that's non-functioning so let's get rid of it and repeal it. 
and try to attack this in a meaningful way. Okay. Freeman? Your Honor, I have a couple more things under staff report. Okay, I thought we just had them. You know, you should always assume that I have more than just what is I stated. always assume that. That's <laughs> why I'm trying to gloss over it. I mean, come on. It's, what is that, 8 o'clock? And that's crazy. We need to be here for at least another hour. Is there a milkshake right around right now? We've got a record of 7.05. Do you want to try to beat that? We won't be able to beat that tonight, but... Um, as you know, we're doing a request for proposals for city attorney services. We received, um, the, the due date was today, and we received several uh, proposals from several firms. Um, over the next month or so, we'll be conducting interviews. We'll have a couple of interview panels. Um, uh, and I'd like uh, a city council member to serve on one of the panels, and also a member of the community to serve on one of the panels as well. So um, I guess if, if the mayor could um, adjudicate which one of you is going to serve on our panel for city attorney interviews, I'd appreciate that. We don't have the dates um, uh, figured out yet. We, you know, because of vacation schedules in August, um, it'll either be sometime in August or the interviews may actually even be early September if that's when we can get everybody back. Um, so, and lastly. Um, this is um, Ryan Lancaster's last city council meeting working for the city of Kenmore. He has another month to go with us. <laughs> I know, but b given all the work that he's completed, he's done way more than a couple months worth of work. Um, and that's what I wanted to point out. Um, he has been extremely productive and he's very bright and <coughs> has been a great help to us this summer. He got a degree in urban planning, went into the consulting wor world, and helped write comp plans for small cities. So he's definitely got some experience, and it shows. Um, but I think he realized he wanted to become a city manager someday. In order to do that, he kind of needed to take a step back, get his master's degree, uh, become a lower paid intern than what he was making in the consulting world. But. Uh, I think it'll, it'll line up with his ultimate career goals. Um, but yeah, he's just been phenomenal. And if the city had a Rookie of the Year award, I would nominate him. But so anyway, that's all I have, Your Honor. All right. Um, council members, uh, reports, comments, initiatives. Council Member Marshall, anything? Yes. Uh, it was brought to my attention that there were several informal discussions about possible or potential locations of a, a swimming pool, a new swimming pool uh, in North Shore. Um, a couple places, and not concerning, not by the city of Kenmore at all, um, but a couple locations were the Seattle Times building, potentially, I don't know where that's at, and then most recently uh, the Gold Creek uh, Club, which is uh, far out in Woodenville. Um, so Friday, uh, Council Member Shrebnik came up, uh, I think, very enthu enthusiastically with a uh, idea that we could perhaps propose a study um, in Kenmore that would consider where in our area a most feasible location might be and that we could uh, fund that. So. I'm comfortable with at least stating now that, or seeing if there's support for um, considering the idea and then with input or guidance from our city manager as to a limitation on such a study. I don't know what they would cost. I wouldn't want them, I wouldn't want it to be any more expensive than it would have to be. Um, what range we could look at for that, for a initial study as the city of Kenmore where we could put a pool in town or nearby. Yeah, I'm a little concerned about the funding of it. What do you think a report like that would cost? I, I actually don't know. I, it, it could be it, it could be as expensive as you wanted it to be, or it could be, you know, kind of a more of a thirty thousand foot view and a little less expensive. Um, and 
Council Member Marshall, are you suggesting that the cost be shared among the three cities and the school district? Yeah, I think if we wanted to get everybody's skin in the game, although um, Council Member Shrednick has an idea on that as well. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. I would support the shared contribution if we can get it. Yeah, um, yeah if we're going to concentrate on putting around Kenmore, it might be tough to get. Well, I guess, yeah, and how I was thinking about it was, you know, a, a citing study that, you know, would extend beyond Kenmore, that it would be the, you know, throughout the, the district, but ensuring that it's within a reasonable radius to Kenmore. Yeah, and, the, and similar to the public, <laughs> similar to the public works shop, uh, you know, establishing criteria for citing, including centrality as a criterion that would help, help it score well. And yeah, and to be to be clear, I think actually the proposal was just that, was the first step would be someone, a consult, I guess a consultant that would help establish what those criteria would be to get a foot in the door idea. And then presumably from that, getting buy-in for an actual siting study. Um, and it's just a thought. And I understand there's also potential interest from the city of Kirkland in some kind of cooperation for a pool. Deputy Mayor? Yeah, I mean, it, it would have to be multi-jurisdictional because at the end of the day, we're not paying for a pool on our own. There's just no way that's gonna happen. So yeah, I'm, I'm supportive of us working with our with, with our neighbors just to kind of get the ball rolling because it seems like we've been kind of having fits and starts and talks, but no, this would be a good way to actually set something in motion. Well, I think we should also be cognizant of how much time it's gonna take and what might have to be given up City Manager, do you have time to take it on? Well, if I can make my other cities do a lot of the work, we can probably squeeze a little bit of it can in. Can you accomplish that is what I'm asking. Um, we, would, we always have to, you know, it, it, when it comes to workload, a lot of it is a zero-sum game, and so we have to look at other things we're working on and see if they get deleted or, or delayed. But um, <clears throat> Right now, uh, it, it, there's always things that come up as an emergency. Like one thing that's taking our time right now is the NPRSA work. And, and um, thank goodness for interns, because um, Ryan has uh, scrambled to put together the information the board needed to make a decision the other night. Um, but um, we try to make room for emergencies or unexpected things that come up knowing that we have the ability to readjust things in our work plan with your consent. So that's a yes, you can make time to, to do it. <laughs> if, if you allow us to um, adjust other things in our work plan, then yes. Deputy Mayor. Well, uh, Rob, I would argue that the, with the school district's interest in a pool that, and with their much greater staff capacity, and frankly, their expertise around real estate if the cities were to chip in the money, they might be able to be talked into kind of taking the lead, taking the lead on getting the contract and working the contract. Um, they have the capacity for that sort of thing, I would think, better than mm -hmm. the cities do anyway. And their expertise in real estate surpasses at least us, and I assume the other two cities because we're not acquiring the way they are. Um, and frankly, their interest is their interest in a pool is, and their needs are high. Their financial contribution may not be as big as we want at the end of the day, but this is one way they could help get the ball rolling. It's in their best interest anyway. So I would push Dr. Reed and her real estate folks to kind of maybe maybe make it their idea to take the lead on this. Mm. <laughs> if, we can, if we can get Bothell and Bill and some other partners on board. Makes sense. All right, so is there general agreement to uh, sort of stick our toes in the water? Yeah, my agreement would be just to stick the toes in the water yeah. part of it. I wouldn't want to spend a lot of money on this nope. yet, and um, I think we can look all around our, you know, area and see that there's no place for a pool in downtown Kenmore, I think. So, <laughs> you know, spending a lot of money, um, I don't know if I would support well, that. Well, yeah, and, and I'm, I'm hoping that city managers certainly keep us informed on the money side of things. So we can All the time yes and no. the money. If what he'd have to move right. and how much we would give up have to make, yes. spend. All right. All right. Okay. Councilmember Shrebnik. 
Yeah, I just uh, wanted to kind of underscore, I was gonna raise that as well. I'm exciting to know that Kurt Triplett has expressed some interest in this as well. So it you know, really could be a um, fifth partner potentially too if their district um, comes in and of course another city as well. Um, so um, yeah, so that could be exciting. And I think that um, timing is good uh, given that there's the uh, levy that King County is putting forward that has some funds specifically set aside for uh, for pools. Um, you know, it'd be great if we had our ducks in a row. When that is passed, hopefully it will be passed. Um, and to have, you know, partners in place with some sense of a plan would be uh, really terrific. Um, and my only other comment is, um, as if theater is putting on the Kenmore Quickies this weekend, the short plays, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I hope people can go and support them, uh, 7.30 Friday, Saturday, and five o'clock on Sunday, right at our own Kenmore Community Club. Council Member Dudniewski. Nothing to add. Deputy Mayor. Nothing to add, but I would be curious to hear a report from the MPRSA meeting uh, last week. Yes. Could I ask Councilman Marshall what happened there? Yes, but we have a, uh, I think at least a caution by the city attorney. Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, because this is a pending ballot measure, um, the city is precluded from using a public facility um, to either further or oppose the ballot measure. So what you can do when discussing this is to express facts, um, but not to state a position one way or another. And as I was mentioning prior to the meeting, I always caution against using adjectives. So just facts, nothing but the facts, and then you uh, will be consistent with state law. Okay. So to, to boil it down, then the NPRSA, after lengthy discussion and after um, I brought as best I could the concerns of the council and Ken Moore's concerns before the the board passed or passed a resolution to introduce the uh, on the ballot the levy for four cents on the dollar uh, for the NPRSA and I think that's I think it's to address capital facilities uh, and not maintenance and that's going on the November ballot Yes. November ballot. Okay, thank you. And uh, if I could just add to that, so that on a $500,000 home, not that there's very many of those around anymore, but a $500,000 home uh, would be about $20 a year if that four cent levy passed. Um, another um, thing that they talked about is they need about $75,000 really soon um, for emergent capital repairs and Long story short, can't, so we came back to you with a f proposed five-way agreement for the three cities and the, and the two counties to contribute to that, and you, you approved that a few months ago. Um, long story short, the two counties aren't participating in that. It's not that they can't, they're just, they just won't, and the reasons for why they won't are uh, too lengthy to go into right now. So the latest idea is for the three cities to come up with that $75,000 on condition that we will be paid back if a ballot measure passes. So that's the latest. Okay, thank you. Nothing else to add? All right, so um, city manager mentioned uh, a panel to uh, put together to interview or be part of to put the uh, city attorney. So um, you're envisioning this to be daytime, um, one full day? Probably one full day. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's five firms that have submitted, so we'd be doing five interviews. So maybe a half a day over lunch too. I certainly have the time and would be happy to do it, but if you want to do this, and if you want to do this, please let me know. What's your time frame? Well, I 
we haven't landed on a date. It'll be either second half of August or first part of September when we do those interviews. So keep that in mind. If you want to do it, huh? let me know. All right. Um, July 31st, week from Wednesday. Week from, yeah, this Wednesday. Um, uh, Sound City's dinner in Renton. Love it if you all could go. Networking uh, event. So um, if you can go, that would be great. We can just talk with Nancy Meehan and she'll work it all out. So anyway, if there's nothing else. I forgot one, one other update. Um, uh, Becky Range has been working diligently with our census contact and the King County um, Complete Count Coordinator, and um, we're having a um, kind of leadership meeting this Wednesday, and then uh, gearing up for our second kind of full census count committee meeting in August, be mid-August it looks like, and um, so if folks are interested or spread the word about um, helping uh, get the word out around the census, I can help connect you to the committee. Your All Honor, right. one more thing. Um, City Attorney just reminded me that your agenda shows a tentative meeting for Monday the 29th of this month. We're actually not going to have a meeting on the 29th. It would have been a special meeting anyway. So no meeting on July 29th. So do you need a motion to cancel that meeting or no? Fine. Yeah. We are adjourned. It is so embarrassing.